started off together so many years ago danced in the sunshine and made angels in the snow our lives were filled with innocence this world it turned so slow now my most beloved friend together we grow old with her. First of all, as a Chief Justice, she supervises all of the courts in Massachusetts. But before that, being assigned to that position or, or getting that position, she was a presiding justice in the Lynn Juvenile Court. So she's very familiar with our communities, familiar with youth in the area, and also sort of sensitive to the things that you all are dealing with because of that position. So she and some of the other judges in the Essex County Juvenile Court became somewhat concerned about some of the social media postings and threatening messages that, that were, were taking place and the students were coming in front of them as um, in the court. And really were thinking, what can we do to help prevent these students from coming in front of the court and getting records? And so she reached out to North Shore Community Mediation Center to see if we could partner, collaborate, do something together to maybe get the word out, to educate students so that they're not finding themselves in court um, and in a very difficult position where they're getting, having records, et cetera. And so we partnered on a, an innovative trial court uh, grant, and particularly around the issues of, of education and, and prevention. And you know, you guys, that's what we're all about, preventing, right? Preventing escalating conflicts. So, this was pretty exciting for us, and it was a great way for us to get to know Judge Nectum a little bit better. And I'm just so thrilled. First, I want to just say to you that there are a couple of the results of that grant were a poster, which we have back there. If you don't have one at your school, be sure to get one in the back. Anya's been trying to get them to the schools. They're in the back of the table where you signed in, and also some brochures. So um, again, we're just trying to get the word out so that you can make sure that your peers also understand this. I am really honored and pleased to welcome this morning, to give you a, another welcome, Judge Amy Nettman. Well, good morning. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for the invitation, Cynthia, because um, I really am so proud of the project that we did together in, in hopes of of educating so many of the young people in the community and their families about the high risks of uh, information that goes over the internet and texting and on your phone and how that becomes a permanent record and can follow you wherever you go. So it is important uh, work that we did. And I also want to thank Tim Linehan, who's here, who's from, is also a uh, leader and a director in the trial court on our alternate dispute resolution committee. And, and Tim, you were very uh, involved and, and helpful in making this project uh, work for us. And I want to say congratulations to the North Shore uh, Mediation Center for 20 years. It's hard to believe it's 20 years we've been in operation in this community. 
And I think this is the 12th year, if I read it right, the 12th year, year that you're celebrating all of you, your peer uh, mediation leaders. And I, I have to say uh, to all of you, you know, congratulations, because you all are, when I look out at the, the your faces and, and see, I know it's morning and you're all waking up, but uh, you all are our leaders of tomorrow. You are, we hold the future in your hands. And I know that seems like a daunting responsibility, but in fact it is because with leadership, and I see you all as our next leaders in your generation and beyond, but with leadership, there is a privilege to leadership, but there's also a great responsibility to leadership. So this morning, and my welcome, I'm not going to talk too long either, but I want you to start thinking about what qualities matter to you as leaders in your community. And I think that will play into the work that you're going to do over the course of the next few hours. But uh, before I uh, bring some of that uh, to the forefront, I want to tell you a little bit about my story, because I think it's important when you, when you see somebody before you and they start to talk, you want to say, well, who are you and how'd you get there and uh, what's going on with you? And so I want to just tell you a little bit about me and that um, I grew up in Chelsea. I consider myself a, a city kid, a Chelsea kid, and I, and I also uh, credit that community and the diversity in that community of lifestyles and people to to have given me the grounding I need to do the work that I do in the in the juvenile court. Um, I graduated from Chelsea High School and I was a uh, I think what got my spirit going and, and I got in touch with really who I was and what I want to do and how I want to motivate the community was I was a cheerleader at Chelsea High School for the Red Devils and that tapped into early on what it continues to this day the spirit and the coaching and the cheering that I do in the community with kids and and with adults so you know for me from after graduation went on to uh, to college and uh, I thought that I would get into science I was interested in maybe in medicine or nutrition sciences and I got my degree in science and I get out and I practiced a little bit in that field and I said you know I am not wearing this lab coat and those shoes for the rest of my life. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, this is not for me. It's not enough interaction with, with people. And it didn't afford me the opportunity to bring my spirit, of who, the essence of who I am, to the table. And so I was fortunate to come across a mentor, somebody very special and important to me, that got me interested in the law. And uh, I went to law school evenings while I worked. I stayed, all my education was here in Boston. And I uh, it stayed after law school, went right into uh, work in the community. I've always been in public service. I was a prosecutor in the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office for lots of years, prosecuting child abuse prosecution and tough stuff. But I found uh, that it was work that was very important to me. And I was at that point knew I wanted to work with kids, I wanted to work with the community, and I liked that multidisciplinary approach, that we can't do it together. It takes a community to make some changes and help families and children. So I stayed in law as a prosecutor for years until I was appointed by the governor to become a judge. And of course, as a, to become a judge, you have to be a lawyer, you have to work hard, and it is the uh, privilege uh, to be appointed by the governor here in Massachusetts. And you are appointed then for a term up to uh, 70 years of age. So we're unlike many states in the Commonwealth and that in, uh, in, in the Commonwealth, across the country, many of our judges are elected, which makes it a little different system and, and might take away a little bit, I think, from the independence of the judiciary. Okay, that's another whole conversation. <laughs> Let me get back then to uh, what I do in the juvenile court and what the juvenile court is. You may have heard the juvenile court and uh, hopefully you haven't had the experience with the juvenile court, but if you have, it's okay as well. Because the juvenile court, we're not visible in the community, we're not open to the public, we are by law, our doors are closed, and the work that we do in the juvenile court is confidential and it's confidential for a reason, because we're dealing with some of the most sensitive, private, 
personal difficult problems that kids have along the way, and with families that are uh, involved with possibly allegations of abusing or neglecting their kids. The, uh, the court is, again, is closed. It's closed for a reason so that any, any involvement that a youth might have is not open for uh, the public to see. It gives an opportunity for kids that if they make a mistake or make poor judgment or get involved with the law, they have an opportunity for a second chance. I, I like to think of the, the juvenile court as really the, it's a, the court that is the first line of opportunity because if, if I open the doors for you, if you could just take a visual with me of what the juvenile court looks like, we are an opportunity or a court of people that when you're in trouble or when a family is struggling, whether it's substance abuse issues for kids or adults, whether it's mental health issues, whether it's poverty, whether it's uh, any number of combinations, incidents of domestic violence, individuals and citizens in our communities come through the door and we have professionals, specialized professionals that can help. Judges and probation officers and clinicians and mediators who embrace the child, embrace the family, to support them, rehabilitate them, get them on the right path, and provide opportunities. And, and I see all of your work as peer mediators is doing the same thing. We solve problems. We tackle conflict in a way that provides for a much safer and more, more a, a strengthened community. So just to get an idea of the juvenile court, the juvenile court, we're in every community across the state. And last year alone, we had 37,000 cases. So and that's not, again, you don't read or you see that. 37,000 cases, over 10,000 young people were involved with incidents of the law. Incidents that are from trespass all the way up to murder. We deal with all of that. And this, uh, these are circumstances where the court, the judge, has to deal with helping a juvenile and helping a child, empowering a child, but also being concerned with public safety. So as judges, and you see the scales of justice, it's a balancing act for all of us in our courts. We had over almost 4,000 cases in Massachusetts last year that dealt with abuse and neglect of kids. And many of those kids were able to return home, and unfortunately many of them were not, and have had to be uh, embraced by wonderful people in our communities, whether it's foster care or through adoption, and it's an extraordinary to see the work of the communities along with the juvenile court. So, you know, and I like to say no kids, there's no bad kids, really. It's, it's uh, young people have not had, some have not had the, the opportunity and the advantages of love and support that others have so that they can soar. And we try to embrace those kids and give them uh, alternate opportunities and chances to feel safe and loved in, in your homes and in your communities. So that's a, just a, a little bit of overview of who we are in the juvenile court. Um, and so I want to get back a little bit to, to leadership. And as I said, I think all of you are, are leaders. I'm, I'm so excited to see such a full room. And when Cynthia invited me, I, I couldn't have been more excited to meet all of you and to, and to embrace and, and, and applaud your leadership because leadership is something, I'm not sure that you've given it much thought. You hear the word, what's it mean? What does it mean to you? And I think it's something that in the course of the day, I want you to think about, is it, is, does leadership come naturally to you or is it something that you learn? I, it's a debate and I think it's fair to say that it's a combination of the two. You're all here because you probably, many of you probably said, hey, do you want to do this? You want to volunteer? I'll do that. That sounds interesting. I'm going to jump in. And then others may have been asked because somebody else sees a leadership quality in you. But however you got here, make no mistake that you're the leaders and you're the future leaders of our communities and we, and we rely on you to take us forward into the next, next year's foreseeable future. So I want you to think about a few things as you think about you sit there and think about what it means to you and some of the qualities that you embrace. 
And when I think of, of leadership, I think of, of having integrity. And integrity means that you have, to be, you have to be true to your word. You can't say one thing and then do another. You have to be honest. Honest in your communication as you sit across from another young person or two young people and try to mediate a problem. They're going to know if you're not honest or you're not authentic. And some type of vision, you have to hold a vision. Vision for some, something you see that the result of your interaction as you mediate or as you do anything in life. And you have to be able to communicate. I know you're going to work on that today. And communication is not easy because sometimes we talk and we get out of our mind, starts to run, and you have to stay focused to the task at hand. And you have to be inspirational and motivational and build trust along the way. It's not easy always to motivate. And that comes from within and believing in yourselves and believing what you're doing. And one of the more important things I see is building a consensus. And that you both win when you're looking at, at two people across from you. It's not, no one's right, no one's wrong. You've got to come to a, a point that says we both can win, we both can take part in, in our move forward and feeling that you've been treated, and most of all, with respect and kindness and appreciation. And I think the bottom line to me is that leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. You, you never finish. You continue to grow and you continue to learn. And I know you're all here to do that now. You're teachers as leaders and your behavior sets the bar. You have to be really careful about your behavior. You lead by example. And I know that all of you are, are doing that, but sometimes you think, even when you're not mediating, when you're not in school, your behavior outside of school is closely watched by those that you might try to, it might try to impact. So I see leadership as well as, and I read this and it stuck with me, is, is uh, really leadership is about recognizing the problem before it comes an emergency. And I think that's what you're all doing here, is recognizing there's a problem, and before there's an emergency, and any number of, of your colleagues or your peers find yourself or uh, themselves in the juvenile court before one of, one of our judges. And you have the opportunity as leaders to unlock personal potential. You all have so much potential, and the people that you meet also have potential. They need a little, a little nudge to open that potential and to, 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 to find the possibilities that they have, be open to the possibilities. So I'm going to close with saying that you are all a very impressive, very impressive group of young people. I am, I'm honored to be in the room and I'm honored to, to serve the community and juvenile justice because there's nothing more important than kids and we need to invest in all of you and I I applaud you. I I think you're in, in, I get empowered just just looking at, at you and your faces. I want to remind you to be to really be proud of yourself, but be true to yourself. You can't fake it. You have to find the strength inside of you and who you are. Keep open minds and remember to keep your nose clean. All right? <laughs> That means your behavior is, is you are our stars, and we're counting on you. And any one of you, please feel free to reach out to me, and uh, reach out to any of the judges in the community, and speak with them, and I hope you'll be, some, some of you will be our, our next lawyers and judges, and I look forward to hearing more about your work today. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you, and I wish you good luck on your journeys. Thank you very much. Days are filled with laughter And we're not afraid to cry But love is all around us Its power is so strong For you, my very special friend I sing for you this song And I'm happy you are you, my friend And I'm awfully glad that I'm me I love you for who you are And friends 